Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a, you know, it's a reasonably mild Florida Friday morning. It could be much, much worse. Uh, the temperature is probably in the low 70s. Humidity is not terrible. But let me tell you, man, by noon, 1 o'clock, it is going to be roasting hot, miserable, horrible, tropical Florida weather that just bakes the skin off you. I mean, I got in this car yesterday at about 3 p.m. and had been sitting outside. And, you know, I touched a few of the flat surfaces and thought I should probably get to a Shriners hospital. I mean, it was just... It's just unfit for human existence. It really is. And it's only May. And it's only early May. And it's only going to get so much friggin' worse uh, before it gets any better. And the chances of me getting out of town are looking kind of slimmer and slimmer as time goes on. And uh, that's just the way it is. So there's the weather report. Basically, the weather is just gonna be absolute shit for the next few months and that's uh you know i could just repeat that uh, every time i do a video and it's gonna hold true so that said let's just jump right into this thing i know it's been a while since i did a video i want to knock a few out you know i started that shop I'm not going to say against my will because, you know, obviously I'm a person with free choice. I could have done what I wanted, but I ended up doing it, uh, even if it was at the behest of others. And uh, it's been a living nightmare. I mean, trying to get this thing up off the ground, trying to get cars ready, hiring Dalton, which, you know, you want to get cars to the finish line. And it's like trying to run the Kentucky Derby with a three-legged camel on crack. I mean... Uh, it's just, you know, I shouldn't say crack because crack might actually speed him up. Uh, he must be doing Xanax or something because, I mean, the guy, uh, you know, you see him sitting there in this chair and it's the only thing in the shop that he's worn out is his chair. Uh, and he said, and he's trying to polish the side of the car, but he's like three inches away from it looking at his phone. So you have to walk up to him and kind of push the chair forward so the rag starts touching the car and, uh, you know, go from there. So anyway, that's what I've been up against. Getting cars ready has been a nightmare. Uh, I've also ended up with a bunch of project cars that take forever to get ready, which is another reason the videos are slow coming. And uh, it's just nice to finally have something close enough to do. Not even done. Just close enough. Uh, soon, maybe, I'll have that Pinto coming up. I'm waiting for a parts Pinto to arrive. Uh, we got that international truck, which uh, is a long, long story, but uh, basically we're trying to sort of free up the engine and make that work. We'll get into that some other day. And uh, finally, that Handshaker Jaguar, which is a great car, uh, but it turns out if you need an oil uh, cooling unit, you know, you might be able to find one in England, but you're probably better off finding one that was exported to the Republic of Chad back in the 80s. Or, very tough to find, but we did get one, and uh, the transsexual mechanic did manage to get it installed last week, so that car should be coming up. And there I go, so I was going to jump into it, and then I do that. Now I'm going to jump into it. I'm really happy to have this car. Uh, and I'll tell you why as we go. But this is a 1986 Chevrolet Corvette. Obviously, that's not going to be a secret to many people that it's a Corvette. Uh, Corvettes are pretty obviously Corvettes. I've had a host of later model Corvettes and done videos on them over the years. This is the first one of my era. You know, inarguably, and the Corvette guys are going to tell you this, the later C4s, and that's what this is, a fourth generation vet, uh, are better than the earlier ones. Fine. I agree. I mean, Chevrolet enhanced and upgraded and refined the product as they went along. And the earlier vets, you know, lost some of the features that people either didn't like or that didn't hold up well. So, yeah, fine. But the earlier vets are the ones that I love for a variety of reasons. And, man, you know, I have that IROC project, another car that I'm thinking about hanging on to. Now I got this thing, and I'm in a personal crisis trying to figure out which one to sell and which one to move because I just absolutely love driving this car. Uh, but let's do a real quick thing. We'll just go over it. So look, 
The C3, which is probably a much more famous looking Corvette to most people, came out before this one, obviously, the third generation. Uh, it came out in 1968. Uh, it replaced the C2, although it actually shared most of the underpinnings from that car. Uh, but that car, that C3, uh, you know, what some people call the Coke bottle, if you will, it ran for 15 and a half years of production, all the way up to 1982. And to say that it was getting long in the tooth uh, by the time 82 rolled around is the understatement of the century. I mean, this thing was like a Model T uh, driving around. and. People wanted a new Corvette. There was, you know, this Corvette people, the, even the people, you know, you take a guy who never drove a car, he's like, you know, oh, I think we should have world peace and Chevy should probably make a new Corvette. I mean, it was just a thing. Uh, a guy named Dave McClellan took over from uh, the very famous uh, Zora Arca Stuntov, uh, known as the father of the Corvette, or at least the stepfather of the Corvette, in uh, the mid I think, 75. And a couple of years later, the plans for this car started to get going, and it was put together fairly quickly. Uh, but it was one of the most harmonious and happy GM production teams that maybe ever happened. Uh, if you look into the inner story of the car, basically everyone got along with everyone. All the engineers, very little argument, very little hiccups. The car came together very well. And it was an absolute, I mean, it's, it's cliched to say that the car was a sea change from her, which it was. But it, it, here's the key to this car and what makes it to me the most fascinating, the first C4s. It changed, look at this, Peter's insane cat has been stalking, thank God this isn't the giant one, but he still looks pretty menacing and it's been sitting over there eyeing me for a while. Hopefully he's not alerting his friends to come over and leap up and attach to my face, but you never know. Anyway, um, so it was a huge deal, and here's why it was a huge deal. It basically set the trend of the Corvette for the modern era, and that means that it, it set the trend for world-class beating performance at half the price, even though it was kind of an expensive car in the United States, you know, compared to a lot of other cars, it had world-class performance that could take it to the Europeans uh, in a way that really scared them a little bit. And that would become the theme of the Corvette from then on, uh, even today. Now when we have this mid-engine C8 Corvette, uh, the theme is the very same. Let's take it to Ferrari. Let's take it to Lamborghini. Let's beat their figures. Let's be faster. Let's try to be better. Better, and uh, we'll do it for half the price. And that is what the C4 did back when it came out. So uh, it was meant to be a 1983 model. That did not happen because of quality control problems, which frankly, I'm not surprised. I mean, there was so much new about this car, not just in terms of style, underpinnings, looks, all that sort of thing, uh, but the materials, the way it went together, uh, it was so different that it obviously took them a while to get it sorted, and they took it so seriously that they didn't want to release an inferior product. So essentially, when it was running late, uh, they decided to go ahead and just skip the 1983 model altogether. I think one remains. It was None of them were ever released to the public, but they made, you know, 20 a handful anyway of 83 models. Most of them got crushed or destroyed. One remains and it's supposed to be in the Bowling Green Museum. Uh, but it was the only year they ever didn't make the Corvette since its introduction back in 53. So, uh, so it's kind of a big deal. But they started selling these 84s in March of 83. So it was a very early model and it ran for 15 months and they ended up selling over 50,000 of them. Doubled their uh, desired, you know, target production figure, target sales figure, obviously having a 15-month production run helped, but the car was immediately successful. Obviously, a bunch of that was going to be people had to go run out and buy the newest thing, uh, but the other half of that was people who looked at the reviews, looked at the write-up, saw it as Motor Trend's car. There's a bird who just flew up there, and he's keeping an eye on me it's right now, and you never know if they're going to be a harbinger of calling their friends over. 
Hopefully those cats will take care of them. Uh, but anyway, you looked at the reviews, you looked at all the, you know, Motor Week had a big special on one, Motor Trends Car of the Year, Car and Driver Brock Yates loved it, right car guy. And uh, we'll get into why as we go. But that obviously drove sales as well. The looks were not immediately appreciated. I mean, you have to understand this thing came out and replaced this incredibly machismo slash sexual coke bottle corvette with giant flared fenders and a narrowed waist and uh you know just sort of a very sinister looking car this thing looked much more kind of composite and mild uh, it no longer pinched in at the waist you obviously have a nice sleek look to it but it doesn't have all the exaggerated features that the earlier car did and part of that was because the design and mission of this car was all business much more than it, it had to look like a corvette and they did pull that off uh, but it, it still had to do it still had to do more than that it had to be a real sports car uh, there was some disappointment that it wasn't some sort of you know mid-engine f-16 type fighter thing you know people were hoping for that I mean, uh, you know or just, yeah, duntoff had wanted a mid-engine corvette for a long time there was that aero vet in the 70s there was a lot of talk about a mid-engine Corvette, uh, but they eventually decided, look, you know, what mid-engine car sells in great volume? Let's just keep this thing in what's now the traditional Corvette style of a front-engine, well, front-mid-engine uh, V8 rear drive, you know, eight-cylinder instead of some weird six-cylinder mid-engine thing, and uh, and it worked out. Uh, so look, let's have a quick look around. Well, what are we going to do? I got to think about it for a minute. Well, okay, real quick. So it's still the malaise era when this car is made, basically. You know, that's starting to come to an end. Cars are getting a little bit quicker. Uh, companies are figuring out emissions versus horsepower. But the horsepower ratings at the time still sucked. And the engine for the car was going to be a carryover from the prior car. So, uh, you know, the 82 Corvette had this um, L83 twin throttle body ceasefire, nah, they called it crossfire injection, but everyone hated it, ceasefire injection V8. That was going to be in this new car, so uh, they knew it wasn't going to put out a ton of horsepower. It wasn't going to be, you know, rocket ship fast. So the focus became on making the car handle, making it break, making it tight, uh, making it a sports car, and then maybe they figured the rest of it would come later, uh, the power stuff, and sure enough, it did. So uh, their plan definitely worked. And there was a lot of new features in this thing. Um, the fiberglass, it's still fiberglass, but it changed the way it was made. It's a molded plasticky kind of fiberglass with urethane front and rear bumpers. Uh, the hood uh, was the biggest and most whatever you it's the biggest piece of fiberglass ever put on an American car. It's an enormous hood and it's a very cool design. Uh, it no longer used a body on frame setup. Uh, instead of that, it used um, not a unibody, but a uniframe. Uh, basically, the uh, it was uh, like the windshield frame in this is welded to the bottom. I mean, it's part of the structure of the car, as is that Targa hoop at the back where you see the third brake light. And then the body panels are sort of built around that. Uh, so it had a unique construction at the time that, you know, really worked well. Um, it was shorter, uh, significantly so, than the prior Corvette. It was a little bit wider, uh, and it had a lot more interior room. Uh, which, uh, you know, was again part of what they really wanted to have. It was also the first Corvette in decades to not have twin headlamps, uh, but it still did keep the pop-up headlamps, which I think is great. And I look at the car now, and I just still absolutely love it. I mean, when it came out in 84, I was 13 years old. I'm watching Night Rider on TV. I'm loving cars. I, you know, I'm not looking at it like an adult. All I see is this insanely cool looking piece and it had a strong impact on my youth. So um, what are you gonna do? The love is in my heart for that. And part of that's on the inside as well, which we'll get into when we do it. So I tell you what, I'm gonna take a quick break there. When I come back, I'm gonna talk about how this car is a project as part of my new little shop thing where we're getting cars ready for collector auctions. Uh, what's been done to it, what's gonna be done to it, and where it's going from here. And uh, it'll be, you know, like that Camaro thing we did. So anyway, bear with me a minute and uh, let me get my crap together.
All right, so let's take a quick look at this car as I saw it as a project car when I first got it. Now, a friend of mine who is a wholesaler at a very, very fancy car store, and I mean very fancy, like when I went to pick this thing up, it was parked between a Ford GT, uh, a mod you know, that, that $1.2 million version, and uh, an old Ferrari Daytona. So they really didn't put a lot of stock in this thing or, you know, value it too much, which helped me out. So I got it fairly cheap. I, can't, I think I paid six grand for it, uh, which felt pretty good at the time. But it had some drawbacks. The first thing I noticed when I walked up to it was the wheels, which I dislike immensely. Yet I accept, and I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, the 86 wheel, I didn't love that either. It was the same as the 84, although it was one of the first 16-inch wheels in uh, American production, and that made it kind of cool. Probably my favorite Corvette wheel, at least on the C4s, is the uh, 88, 89, 90 wheel, which was a 17, and I thought it looked gorgeous, and if I had a set somewhere, I'd probably put them on this car. These wheels, I believe, are reproductions in chrome, and I'm not a big chrome fan, but maybe the market, I like them. I don't care. I'm not going to change them because it starts to get too expensive, uh, but they're from a later Corvette. You're talking probably 95, 96, maybe 94. Um, they're five-star. They do show off a lot of the brakes behind them, so they have to look good. Uh, the guy put Eagle F1 uh, tires on it, which is terrific. Uh, really, really good tires. And because they are C4 wheels, I can live with them. And unless something else falls in my lap, I'm just going to go with them. Uh, they're in chrome, which I don't think Chevy did on their own. So it has these generic center caps. I've searched high and low. Uh, for actual Chevy center caps that will highlight that it's a Corvette. Couldn't find them. Eventually, I had to come up with some kind of high temperature decals that some guy's selling to do the same thing. And uh, that's when it's going to get. But I'm not going to do that till the car is done because with my luck, they'll probably just fall off. So uh, that was one of the immediate issues. Uh, number two, to me, it looked like the front end of the car had been lowered. I really need to take more pictures of these things so I can do these videos proper. But it looked like the front end had been lowered and the rear end was still sitting pretty high. I mean, it reminded me of being jacked up like that Pinto. It was kind of annoying. Uh, and uh, I thought, okay, man, I got to drop the back in this thing. Never did that in a C4 before. So I Googled C4 lowering kit for the rear. Uh, was, you know, it's sitting down sweating, thinking about what this thing's going to cost. And then it turned out to be a couple of bolts that cost 50. In fact, I probably could have gone to the hardware store and bought the bolts, but uh, it was 52 bucks. And all it does is take some of the pressure off the back leaf spring and drop the rear two inches to give it a very, I think, proper ride height, which it has now. I love the way it looks. It matches to me. No longer, I, I could fit four fingers in the in the back of this thing and, and only one of them reminds me of being in college with that one girlfriend I had. Anyway, uh, four fingers in the back, one in the front. It just looked silly. And uh, now I think it looks great and that was cheap to do so that was a plus. More irritating than that, back in, and I'm kind of jumping ahead, but we'll get into it anyway. And look, so the Corvette, this year Corvette and 84 on had this insane F-16 style liquid crystal fighter jet uh, instrument display and a lot of people hate it I love it it's my favorite feature of these cars and uh, it was gone and in its place and he was trying to sell this to me as a feature which to me it wasn't I put new struts in by the way they were expensive but anyway it had this in there uh, which was called Vet Aid. It looks like it was something that was sold 10 years or 12 years ago. They don't exist anymore. Um, they, you know, this setup exists, but not by the same company. Uh, it's actually rather beautiful. I mean, they're using pretty expensive Autometer Sport Comp gauges. They have every gauge you would have had with the electronic one. And more to the point, it's plug and play with the old system. So uh, this is probably, you know, eight, nine hundred. Who knows? This thing probably cost twelve hundred back in the day. And if 
I had a track car, a track Corvette, man, would that be perfect. Uh, but this isn't one. This is a one-owner Corvette with 75,000 miles that obviously the LCD blew up on. And the guy said, man, I think I'm just going to put this in instead. I couldn't live with it. I had to retrofit it. To do that, I had to order the original instrument cluster because it wasn't with the car. That was 450 on Amazon. Uh, but it was a very, very available, readily available, which was great. And uh, I had to, uh, it had 2,000 miles uh, on this uh, GPS speedometer. Uh, the last Carfax reading showed 73 right before it was replaced. So I added 2,000 miles to an odometer, set it correctly, and that should probably approximate the correct miles on the car. Uh, I had to find another surround, this thing, uh, to go around the instrument cluster, you know, because that was missing from the car. I start putting it all together and I realize there's a giant plug on the side of the old LCD cluster that I don't have a plug for. And I'm like, what the hell was that? Well, it turned out that the whole driver information center had been covered up because you no longer need it. Uh, that piece there, you see it has two black squares. One side, the right side is the warning lights. The other side is just a blank uh, because it's covering this, which is the control for that LCD cluster. So, ah, mother fuck. So I had to go back and buy that. That was cheap actually. Found it for like 60 bucks. But I probably have about six, seven hundred bucks in retrofitting this dashboard to the one that I love and frankly the one that I think this car deserves. Um, then I had to put in a window regulator. Uh, this year they still used a belt, a big sort of uh, plasticky belt which ran the window up and down that had broken so I was able to order the belt and even despite my limited mechanical skills I put it in uh, I did use a little bit too much lithium grease though and now it runs up and down on the window so that's got to wear off and that's kind of annoying uh, but anyway there it is uh, I ordered new emblems for it which now are incorrect I didn't notice at the time but they're giving me checkered flags on both sides they were expensive don't know if I can return them and I'm debating whether to use them. Uh, the original emblems are not in bad shape, but I have this thing where I want things to be kind of, you know, pretty close to perfect. Uh, you can see it even has a missing Delco Bose emblem there, which I found. I thought it was in the car, but it's not. Uh, you see how it looks over on the other side. That was 25 bucks, but I found it and I'm going to put it on. Uh, also a new bumper script uh, with red. Again, this one isn't bad, but you know, you can see how it's deteriorated from original, so it's going to get that. Got to find a way to get this little headliner piece in the correct spot. And if you get over here, this was another thing that I really liked about this car, uh, was uh, certainly the fact that it was one owner. There's not many one owner 86s left and had good documentation, including this original Hypertech chip, which was a big thing when I was a kid. Oh, it's got a chip in it, man. It's badass. Uh, it's still the Hypertechs. The guy never put it in or they took it out for some reason. But uh, anyway, I think it's kind of cool that it's still there. Uh, the original keys and the little, you know, if you find this key, drop it in a mailbox thing. They're still with it. Uh, you can see those VATS chips. You see that little black plastic thing in the middle of the key? Uh, that was new for 86 because apparently like 7% of 84 and 85 Corvettes were stolen. So Chevy had to do something. They came up with that chip which had 15 different possible codes and uh, it had to match a box inside the car for the thing to turn on the fuel pump and start the car. Uh, you know, a thief could still have that setup where he had the 15 different chips, but it would take much longer to steal it to get the right one. So anyway, there's that. And it was kind of neat to have that with it. Uh, the original owner documents, pretty cool to all see that. Still with the car, uh, filled out with the guy's name, which matches the title. Uh, didn't have a window sticker, which was a shame, but what are you gonna do? But anyway, it had all this stuff and I thought that was great. Also had a nice set of service records with it, including his original purchase order. Uh, which is here, which I thought was fantastic. And uh, you can see he traded in a 77 Datsun 280Z, uh, which he got, um, where is it here? I think he got like five grand for that car, which I thought was pretty good money. Uh, deposit five grand, worth, maybe it was more than that even. Uh, whatever it was, I was shocked. I thought, wow, so that Datsun really, really had some value back then. 
eh, whatever. Maybe I'll take a picture of it and put it up. But he, uh, he did get pretty good money for his car. But it's neat, again, to have all these original, uh, not just the purchase documents. And you see the car was 30 grand uh, back in the day, which was certainly not cheap. And uh, then, of course, a bunch of service records dating back a long time for the car. So that was another thing that drew me to it and made it worth me putting some money in it. These are those uh, wheel decals I was talking about. And when the car is finished, they're going to be one of the last things that goes on. Uh, over here, that's the wheel lock kit, which I fucking hate wheel locks, but I think they're dangerous. But anyway, it's got them, so we'll just leave them there. So anyway, that's the back. And uh, this was also the first... Uh, Corvette, the 82 had that bubble back window and it was the, the only the collector's edition actually would open and give you access to the back. Uh, all of these C4s had that feature. Uh, you can see instead of T-tops, they went to this bolt-on uh, Targa roof, which became structural and helped stiffen the car, so it was a good idea. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, standard in fiberglass, body matching color. Uh, optional, you could get this sort of plexiglass, Lexan, whatever the hell it is, see through, which is great, other than it's hot as balls in Florida summer. Let's open under the hood. I also put new struts in the hood to make it easier to open. Now, this was a big deal. Uh, probably not since the Jaguar XKE had there been a more racy or attractive hood opening setup where you actually, I mean, the whole thing comes up. Uh, that impact strip down the side, uh, it, it looks good and it hides the weld of the body where it comes together, so it's neat. But look, so back in 84, and it's all filthy in here because I haven't detailed this car yet, but uh, you've got these incredible aluminum control arms. This was the kind of stuff you only saw in like Ferraris or Formula One race cars. Now all of a sudden it's on Corvettes. Uh, they also had these huge 50 series 16 inch meats. I don't know if these are bigger, this modern tire, but yeah, they're close enough. And uh, it was just an incredibly exotic thing. Also, of the way the headlights are facing you. In 84, it had that L83. Uh, very quickly, that got ditched. And in 85, they came out with the L98, uh, another variation of the small block Chevy, now with tune port injection. They call that the lobster for obvious reasons. It looks like one. Uh, but uh, it upped the horsepower, it upped the game and uh, would actually go on to power the um, uh, Camaros and IROCs at 87. They got tuned port earlier, those cars, but they didn't have 350s. In 87, they got the actual Corvette engine. Uh, but the amount of engineering that went into this, and I'm not alone in saying it. I mean, that, that another thing Brock Yates talked about was opening the hood on this car is perfection. Absolute, per I mean, you want to talk about exotic. I mean, how exotic is that <laughs> you know, for a car in eight? Remember that the Corvette that came before it, it you know, has this little fiberglass ill-fitting hood. All of a sudden, this thing looks like something you're going to see, you know, in the pits at Le Mans. Just absolutely uh, incredible to me. Uh, you see the batteries in here, which is a weird spot for it. You actually have to remove this panel to get it out. Uh, but um, eh, there it is. I don't know if it helps with weight or why it's there, or if it makes any sense. Uh, in eight or at least in late 86, they went to aluminum heads. It was supposed to be in every 86, but they had uh, problems getting them ready. Uh, but this one upped the game. So the 84, I think, was 0 to 60, uh, 7.9. Uh, by the time 86 rolled around, we're now in the five and a half second mark. Uh, quarter mile went from high 15s to mid 14s. So the car got much faster uh, with this L98 motor. Uh, most of them were equipped with uh, uh, a four-speed automatic, which was a terrific, uh, um, yeah, terrific uh, thing. Obviously, there's still some Corvette guys out there who want sticks. This one, and by far the reason that I bought this car, has a stick, and uh, as we'll get into it, it's one of the most interesting ones I think um, I think we've ever seen in a modern production car. So I have to go over there to get this down. It's almost to me like on the level of the Prowler. I can't believe they actually did it. Having those new struts in there helps a lot because that is a heavy hood. Uh, this morning I did do a video of the lights popping up, but I'm going to do it again gratuitously because I love it. I am a 
sucker for pop-up lights. And when I was buying this car and I tested the lights, I could tell it had good ownership based on how well they work uh, because uh, a poorly maintained C4, if the lights work at all, they work like shit and they slip the gears and you know you close them and you hear the gears slipping for two minutes afterwards. Uh, these things work like a charm. So I knew this was a good one when I saw it. Uh, all right, there it is. Gonna pause for a minute. I gotta get all my shit in the back of the car. Then we're gonna hop in and go for a spin. All right, so let's do this. Uh, now being an 86, this one still has the rear bumper setup that I like. Uh, in 1990, a ZR1 Corvette came out, which I did a video on, and I'll link to that uh, in the uh, description here. And that had square taillights, and it's significantly wider, but it was, you know, it was probably the only... It's a whole other story. You can watch the video if you want to know. I like this rear end. I like the round lights. Uh, after the ZR1, they changed every Corvette uh, C4 to have those square lights, and I wasn't a fan. And they redesigned the front end uh, bumper, which looked nice, and it's fine, but I prefer this one. Maybe because it's just the one that I knew when I was a kid. Maybe because it actually looks better. I don't know. Either way, this is the one I like. Uh, you see the quad exhaust tips coming down there looking cool like the way the uh, uh, plate is recessed the Corvette script like older Corvettes it has the gas door up here uh, all this of course is going to get detailed by the time it goes to the auction or by the time I keep it we'll see I don't know why we need French I guess for Canada but um, anyway there it is that's the way the gas door works in these things and it's all kind of cool 86 brought the advent of the center brake light um you know and this thing looks more like the navigational equipment from a boat or something they made them a little bit more streamlined in later cars where they put them inside the bumper uh, but uh you know the car companies quickly had to figure out a way to slap a third brake light on all their cars uh, mercedes with the sl they put something that looked like a you know air conditioning unit on a motorhome on the back. Um, again, that uh, target top is bolted down. Uh, this is one of the biggest complaints of the C4 relates to that. So they got rid of the T-tops, which of course had a strengthening bar in the middle. Now they just have a target top. Well, when it's bolted down, and I mean, it's bolted down. Yeah, it actually, these cars, I'll show you, they came with a little snap-on ratchet to do it. It's structural and it's stiff, but when it's off, this car could have squeaked and rattled. So the way that they overcame that is by putting this huge extra support uh, above the rocker panel uh, that really stiffened the car. And it did work great to stiffen the car, but when your average customer is 50 plus years old and, you know, arthritic, getting in and out of this thing, it becomes extremely inelegant. I mean, you have to be Mary Lou Retton to jump in and out of this thing and look good doing it. Uh, for me to get it out is tough, but it is something I'm willing to live with. Now, again, and going back to this being a project car, it's far from perfect. Maybe you guys can help me out with this because I don't know how far to take it. Um, it's got these things on the top of the door panels. Uh, whoever did this did a nice job. I mean, as good as could be done, I think. But these screws are not factory and they're meant to hold in a thing that's breaking and coming apart. Uh, I think they did a decent setup with it, but... The new ones are like 200 bucks. I'm not sure if I want to spend the money on it, if it's worth doing it. But, uh, you know, if you have an opinion, let me know in the comment section. Uh, also, the carpet's coming off a little bit on those door panels. I can buy new ones for six or 700 bucks. But you start doing all this shit to the car, and it be quickly becomes where you can't even break even, never make a few bucks on it. Um, you know, it is pretty tight and together for an old car. That door closes very well, doesn't squeak and rattle, it fits nice. Uh, you know, they really did put a lot of quality control into these cars, far more than they're given credit for. Uh, you know, it's got this Mercedes-style stiffener here, which goes in here. Um, you know, again, they are squeaky, rattly machines, but they also outperform cars. Man, when Car and Driver tested this thing, uh, it was the fastest American production car they'd ever tested. It stopped fast 
faster than any other car they'd ever tested. On the skid pad, it pulled a .9, which was light years beyond any of their better readings from before. Uh, the, the only car that stopped better, by the way, was a 930 Porsche. Uh, the only car that even came close to handling was a 928 and some Ferraris, which were in the low 0.82, 0.83. Uh, this thing outperformed all of them uh, in terms of handling and became world class. And again, that was the point of the Corvette. Uh, now we get over to this car, the seats. This was another issue I have to contend with. These are the original seats. Uh, you can see it's got some ripping going on here. That's why it's pushing forward on the right side and looks a little bit strange. Uh, you know, some of the leathers popping out from around the sport seat controls, which all still work, by the way. These stiffen and these stiffens, which is nice. But I've got a big hole here because obviously the old guy who owned it kept rubbing it, getting in and out of it. New seat leather, you're talking like eight, nine hundred bucks plus installation. I have a guy who might be able to sew in some panels and stitch them up and make them look presentable for probably two or three hundred. You know, where do you go? What do you do? I mean, at a certain point, you got to draw the line. I'm not exactly sure where to do it, but we'll figure it out. Anyway, let me get in this thing. Oh, God, it's kind of a fall in, you know, leap out kind of affair that isn't entirely fair to old guys. And I think that's part of what kept C4 values down for a long time, although they're starting to come up now as people realize their importance as cars and that they're actually a lot of fun to drive. There's an asterisk there. To me, they're fun to drive when they have a stick, and this one does. And it's not just any stick. This is a very weird stick. It's a uh, Doug Nash was a famous hot rodder in Detroit in you know 50s, 60s kind of thing, and then he got into building transmissions and other stuff, and uh, did well with it to the point that Chevy ordered some for their new Corvette. Uh, it's basically a Borg Warner Super T10 with an overdrive automatic overdrive bolted on the ass end of it and it's called the four plus three and uh, it was also done for fuel efficiency at the time but what it is is it gives you this sort of traditional four speed uh, with three overdrives on second third and fourth uh, to the tune where it gave you 28 miles to the gallon on the highway which is pretty fantastic uh, the, the only the export cars was a totally defeatable where you could just turn it off uh, in the American cars it would sort of of reset and uh, well, I think the first ones had a switch here which you could turn off maybe that would stay off this one it's got a button on the top to turn the overdrive on and off which I mean that's so fighter jet to me having a button on top of the shifter I feel I get behind a car I press it I feel like I'm firing heat seekers but I think that's cool uh, but anyway th that will and a lot of people hate the Doug Nash and the first ones the 84s were pretty weak need and they had a lot of problems uh, Corvette the Chevy put some new bearings in them Bush some other stuff to toughen them up and they did get much much better as time went on. But they are quirky and weird. And I compare them to the Prowler a little bit, the Plymouth Prowler. Like, in a way, you scratch your head going, wow, they actually built it. Well, I mean, wow, here is this bizarre four-speed button-operated overdrive transmission in Chevy's state-of-the-art new Corvette. It works a little bit like the old MGs or Triumphs, you know, with, again, the SN bolt-on overdrive, but uh, it was much more technologically advanced at the time. I love it. I just think it's awesome. Not only because it's fun to dick around with, but when you turn it off, you've just got this four speed that feels like the same one you'd get in, like, a Hot Rod 68 Super B, you know, I mean, it's got a true hot roddy four speed. Uh, you got cup holders here, which aren't working because I got you know, the lighters there. Uh, and you know, it's plasticky, but it's not. For the time, it's not bad plastic. GM must up their game a little bit. Uh, your power window switches, your power seat switches, great little place to put narcotics in here. Uh, power mirrors, very basic climate control. They had an electronic one you could have. Uh, the Delco Bose stereo, which was very cool at the time and, uh, you know, sounds great. You got your warning light set up over here. And let me fire it up so we can go through the dashboard, which is truly one of my favorite parts. Uh, oh, you have to get the wipers on that side. Look at this self-test. I absolutely... 
absolutely love this instrument cluster. Oh, do I love it. All right. And a lot of people hated it. They hated it so much that Chevy had to put uh, analog gauges in some of the later ones. Uh, in 86, they actually angled the gauges a little different to cut down on glare. That's something they'd figured out. Uh, but you've got this big, again, being the 80s, you only have an 85 mile an hour speedo. And this car would top out at 150, by the way, with this... Um, uh, the L98, it was pretty quick, but the three digit miles per hour did continue on. And I remember being, I want, I'm not going to tell the story because it get me in trouble, but I was a kid in North Carolina. I'm not going to say I was in any way sober. Uh, and me and a friend were on, uh, we were heading from Hickory to Lenore and I did manage to get his piece of shit 85 Corvette to indicate 145, but, um, that was uh, that was a different world. Uh, now this was interesting. So when I first put this cluster back in, all of this shit was blank, and that's when I realized I was missing uh, its control unit over here. Uh, but you see, you've got oil pressure and coolant temp. Okay, so I can change that now. I could turn it off, or I can make it oil temp. Yeah, who cares? But there it is. Oil pressure is better. Uh, coolant temp. I can turn off. Make volts. I like it as coolant temp. Uh, you can have your range, which we have 72 miles, or we can have trip. Uh, the center thing, the green bars, is a bar meter for the amount of fuel. Yeah, it's your fuel gauge, unleaded fuel only. Uh, you can have your average or instant fuel rate. Uh, over here, you've got your tag. I kind of love the hockey stick style. God, I just love it. And you've got an indicator which people confuse for the miles per hour. Uh, or over here, they confuse for the tag. But what are you going to do? And up there, you have your analog uh, odometer, which all works fine. Uh, you got your turn signal. No, it's very old school in the middle. Nice mix of, you know, old technology and new. Uh, you got a tilt steering column and a uh, telescoping, telescoping wheel, which uh, is very much, you know, Corvette famous. Uh, brake light on. You got this interesting pad here, which of course later on would become a, um, an airbag. Uh, and you can see how thin the A pillars are. Again, that's because that is structural. I understand it's kind of a big deal to try and put a windshield in these things, so I'm glad it doesn't need one. Uh, and of course, you've got that uh, Lexan top uh, for, um, you know, whatever, for the sun to come through and bake you to shit. Uh, I found an Abbott cassette in here. Let's see if the cassette plays. I, I promise you, I haven't even tried it yet. Let's see if it works. <laughs> No, it doesn't. It just sticks the cassette out, so I'm not surprised. And then you get in here, and this is fascinating. So this is what these cars came with. Made by Snap-on. Uh, you see it has kind of a Torx head uh, at the end of it, and uh, on and off. And you put those up in here. Uh, there's little holes, yeah, right here. And that's how you bolt this um, target top on. So it's all just kind of fascinating shit the way this car works. Your center console there, you got a trunk release. You got three trunk releases, one on the side of each door and one in the center. Why that was needed, I don't know. And a nice little slot down there for kind of a thin, uh, maybe like a CZ 9mm or something would be nice. Uh, weird little, of course, uh, Corvette floor mats. But anyway, let's go for a spin. Let's put this Doug Nash to the test, which I love. Uh, the e-brake works a lot like on the Jaguars where you lift up to release and uh, away we go. And let me tell you, man, a Corvette with a stick versus a Corvette with a automatic is, if you're a driver, there's no comparison. The, the automatic will bore you to tears. The stick, you're gonna have the time of your life. I mean, it's such a difference. It is so fun uh, to drive one of these cars with a manual gearbox that I just cannot describe it. Um, let me click that on. Okay. All right. So there you see the D indicated. It turned off now. Uh, that means we're going to go into uh, overdrive as we're driving along. It's all going to happen automatically. And the windshield. Oh, yeah. This car hasn't been detailed. So I, okay. So now you see the D is on and we're down. So now I'm going to turn that off. And all of a sudden. We've got this very vintage feeling four speed, which I love. 
And again, not everyone will. And I admit it, yeah, fine, the ZF that came out later was better, but it's a German transmission, and it felt German. And I mean, yeah, okay, so this car had Japanese brake pads. Uh, in 86, it got anti-lock brakes, which came from Bosch, so they were German or Brazilian or where the hell Bosch is from then. So it was kind of a, you know, global car. But this thing, this Doug Nash four-speed, just feels like, you know, America, AR-15s and apple pie and, you know, everything that a V8 sports car, muscle car is supposed to be. Uh, that's nice people and no funny hats. So. Uh, plenty of torque, even with 150 mile an hour top speed, the gearing still has it nicely set up to, there's overdrive. So now look, we're turning 1200 RPMs. Turn that back off. It's a miracle that works. I did actually have to fix the switch. Uh, they do wear out and the contacts break over time. So I was glad that that was the only problem. But uh, anyway, so now the overdrive should be off. And of course, we got morning traffic, which sucks the big one. But... I don't think that feels much different from a 72 Corvette in terms of, you know, where you're shifting the revs. I mean, it just feel so muscular. I absolutely love it. I just love it. I love driving this thing. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for that damn IROC, it would be a no-brainer. So, But it's still in the running, and we'll see what happens. I just don't know which one to keep. So anyway, there it is. Look, I'm going to cut it off there because I'm going to be in traffic. It's not much fun. You know, I can weave in and out and drive like an asshole the way everyone does nowadays. But what's the point? It's a good looking old Chevy up there towing that thing. You know, there's a great example of what's going to be a tremendously collectible truck. And uh, right now it's still in use as a lawn truck. It's funny stuff. If you see one of those out there at the right price, buy it. It's only going to go up. Uh, so here we are, 55 miles an hour, I'm at 23, turn on the overdrive, boom, down to 15. And now we're getting good mileage. I like the little power hump at the top of the hood, ah, I don't know, the hint of fender flares, the pop up the lights. <laughs> Anyway, I'm a sucker for this thing. So 86 uh, Corvette C4, this one will probably be for sale. I think I'm gonna run it through the Mecham auction in July. Uh, and they go cheap, you know, they're going up, no doubt about that, but they still go cheap. They represent an absolute bargain for as important as these cars were. And uh, honestly, as exotic and advanced as these cars were, particularly in their era, um, I think they are way undervalued. You know, the, the perfect ones are starting to pull real money, but man, you can still buy a driver for what to me is just stupid, stupid low money. And uh, I think it's worth doing. I think they're terrific. And if you want to hot rod something, you know, half the shit you have to order for most cars is already on this one. You know, you've got aluminum heads, you've got uh, posi traction, you've got, uh, you know, Bilstein shocks. You've got, I mean, uh, yeah, the amount of go fast shit you could buy for an L98 is awesome. So, um, to me, it's just a terrific car. Absolutely love it. And uh, we'll see where this project goes and what happens from here. So, anyway, thank you very much for having a look. We got more stuff coming up. I've got that Handshaker uh, 87 Series 3 Jag. Uh, I've got a friend of mine who's going to loan me his 500E Mercedes to do. And, um, of course, we've got that Pinto and that International Truck and some other shit coming up. So, uh, you know, sorry not many videos have been around, but again, trying to get everything going. And uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep the dream alive. Thank you very much, and we will see you at the next one. Take care.